Mr. Hirsch, thank you very much for uh, joining us. Uh, I'm uh, honored to be interviewing you, and our audience uh, is honored, I think, uh, to hear what you've got to say. Now, before we turn to Nord Stream, uh, I wonder if I might uh, probe you on these war games, which uh, seem to me to be assuming uh, a greater importance. If you read between the lines, the Speaker of the Congress unexpectedly sent the members of Congress home a, a week early. Uh, the media is rather darkly hinting about the military prowess of all these NATO aircraft and other forces that are right now on the tarmacs and in the waters uh, around uh, the battlefield of, of Ukraine. Is there any possibility in your mind that NATO is about to join the war? Well, it's probably already in it. I mean, in terms of training and advising, you know, there's so many disparate groups now in the Ukrainian army. Somebody once described this offensive. The reason why the current offensive is probably inevitably doomed, it's as if you had 15 different dance teams that have been practicing uh, together or separately for a long time. And if you put them in the one big auditorium and said you have an hour or a day or three days to organize a routine among all of you, um, uh, uh, that would be impossible. And that's what's happening right now with the Ukrainian army. As far as I know, as far as I've been told, I'm not there. I haven't seen it. And I, many reporters aren't there. It's, it, it sounds to me like it's, a, it's carnage in terms of the Ukrainian offensive which means that it's also carnage in terms of the NATO. Um, uh, there is probably the most important NATO operation that's been going on. I don't know what happens to NATO in the long run, um, but um, it isn't going to this isn't going to be good for Ukraine. It's not going to be good for um, NATO. It's certainly not going to be good for the Biden administration, what's going on now. So I understand. Before I turn to other aquatic uh, matters, uh, what was your take on the blowing up of the uh, the uh, um, Karkova Dam? I think it's called Nova Karkova Dam. Uh, just the other day, did you accept the uh, uh, official uh, narrative that the Russians blew it up? Um, uh, uh, you're you're asking somebody. You know, I write a column. I write a, I write once a week on something called Substack in America which is a sort of an independent, I'm, I'm basically I'm self-publishing, although I use the same editors and, uh, and uh, fact checkers I did when I worked for The New Yorker um, for 22 decades. Um, um, uh, 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 I'm not ready to talk about it. I mean, I have an idea and I, I think I know what happened, but I, 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 have, I, I, I don't wanna, uh, uh, I don't wanna tell you right now. That's all, that's, that's for me to write. But okay, good, it's uh, let's turn then. Yeah, uh, let's uh, turn then to uh, what you have already written about, and which is in the public uh, domain, namely the bombing of the Nord Stream. It seems mm -hmm. to be settling as uh, the official American mainstream narrative that it was not Russia uh, that did it, which was what they initially wanted us to believe but that Ukraine did it, and in the last day, that they did it from a base in Poland. Uh, therefore, Ukrainians based in Poland did it. What do you make well, of that counter-narrative? The other part is that it was Ukrainian military units reporting directly to the, the, the equivalent to our uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs in America, the head of the military operations, that are pretty fast and furious right now. And uh, the, the head of um, um, this um, one-time actor, Zelensky, uh, didn't know about it. That's the news story, that it was done by a Ukrainian group. And uh, they're, they're, what can I say? <laughs> well, all I can tell you, it was, it, it was a, a Joe Biden extravaganza. And all that happened is that uh, the United States, and, and to some degree, your country too. Look, uh, you, you, you're suffering from lack of gas right now, lack of cheap fuel. Um, since the Cold War, uh, since containment, since the end of World War II, and we decided that 
the Western world decided that we had to contain uh, Russia, um, uh, et cetera, and China, containment. And um, uh, they decided that one of the great weapons Russia had in this war of ideas and thoughts and power uh, grabs was their gas and oil. And they were weaponizing gas. This became, I think, the Kennedy administration was the first administration to start talking about the darkness of Russia's uh, cheap gas being made available to Europe. And then about uh, in 2011, the first pipeline, Nord Stream 1, was put into action, which which gave uh, Germany an amazing boost of cheap uh, methane gas, uh, very clean gas, more than they could use. There was so much gas um, that was uh, began to drive. You know, Germany's a great industrial country. And uh, even with this, the gas, uh, the, the first pipeline provided so much gas that the Russians were actually um, the uh, the the uh, Germans actually set up companies, and they were they were afraid in the phrase in the oil and gas business is they were selling it downstream, they were selling it to other 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 small companies that serviced uh, uh, the rest of uh, Western Europe, that much gas, and then the, lo and behold, in 2021, a second pipeline had been built and was ready to be um, going into uh, into play in the middle of the Ukrainian battle. And the concern we had in Washington, the best understanding I have, um, and obviously if one reads the story I wrote, it was on Substack, but it's pub it's been published all over that story. It's a, a long, long story with a lot of detail from sort of inside. And um, it actually was, um, uh, um, um, we only did it with the help of the Norwegians, who would no, Norway's been a great American ally in, in um, dirty tricks, if you will. They helped us a lot in Vietnam, early in the Vietnam War, and the Norwegian shipping industry has, has a great capacity to carry stuff that we don't want to carry ourselves for us. So there's been a long-standing tie. Norway supplied the ships. Uh, we supplied the brain power, I guess, and the idea. Um, uh, we also supplied uh, some very highly qualified miners, and, um, divers rather, from a base in Florida. And um, we work closely with the Swedes and the Danes, who somehow still pretend they don't know much about it, but that's their business. Norwegians have not talked about it. Um, and we, we uh, blew up the pipelines underwater um, on demand. Uh, it was done. The idea was initially, um, you know, it's very funny. If you go back and look at the history of it, uh, Biden, uh, this idea originated in 2021 when uh, it looked clear that the Russians were building up their forces uh, in Belarus and um, on the border, and we're going and Putin was going to go in. Uh, he'd had it, as you know. We've been. Uh, I don't think anything justifies a war, but there certainly is a case to be made that we've been systematically lying uh, to the uh, Russian government. Um, going back to 1990, when we when NATO was expanded, when when Germany became one, West and East Germany um, became one country. Um, West Germany was in NATO, and we wanted uh, permission. We made a deal with the Russians that we would not expand uh, not one inch further uh, into Eastern Europe, into uh, East East uh, NATO East. Um, and of course, we lied, and we expanded it enormously over the next three decades. And we've also put nuclear capable missiles um, on the border um, uh, in, in 60, 70 miles from the Russian border in Poland. So all these acts, I, I think, shaped Putin's state of mind. And he's always had a great sensibility, sensitivity about Ukraine. As he, he needed Ukraine as a buffer against the West. And that, and that was something that um, uh, it was all predictable what happened. I mean, a lot of people knew if we kept on pushing, he would do something. Well, he did it. And so in December, they, the White House convened the meeting. Um, uh, I, I'm not a great friend of, uh, of uh, our State Department, uh, uh, Tony Blinken, the, 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 um, the Secretary of State, and Jake Sullivan, who used to be a lawyer for Hillary when she was fighting the, all the problems with her pretty much questionable email. And uh, Victoria Newland, uh, who's a, a arch conservative, who is now Under Secretary of State, all three I, I call them wink and blink and a nod. If you've had ever had children and read those children's stories, um, um, they're all part of a very narrow-minded, terribly anti-Russian group 
And uh, they began, a, the question was how to stop Russia. And one of the ideas that emerged in meetings, I described very pretty thoroughly in, in the article I wrote, meetings in the White House and meetings in the State Department. There were meetings about what to do, and one of the options was blow up the pipelines and let Russia know that we had that option. And so about three weeks or two, let's see, the pipelines were blown up. Uh, the war started on the 23rd on, of t last year, to, uh, 14 months ago, 15, 16 months now. And... Um, uh, in February of uh, uh, 2012, with uh, the head of Germany, uh, uh, Chancellor Scholz, with him, uh, February the 7th, there was a news conference at which Biden Biden was asked, there was a lot of talk about, um, earlier talk about doing something to the pipelines. They said, you know, and the idea was, I think the idea was maybe to tell Putin, we're going to do this. And so don't, you know, you'll lose your pipelines if you start this war. One of the pipelines anyway, certainly Nord Stream 1, they own totally, only a piece of part of the second one. Anyway, um, what happened is that Biden was asked that question uh, about two weeks before the war began, and he said, we know how to do it, we'll do it if we have to. And at that point, it seems to me, um, you have to think maybe he really meant it, which I did, which made that story, once I began to learn what happened, um, much easier uh, to find because I knew where in the government they would do that kind of work. You needed a lot of a lot of skill in underwater technology, and you also needed uh, sophisticated Navy people, and you ha you needed um, the CIA and also people in other agencies that knew how to protect operations. And um, it was supposed to be blown up during a war game in June. The president said no. And then he wanted to blown up in late September of last year. And that's always the question, why then? And one of the things that I thought and others thought too, was by late September last year, any notion of an early victory against the Russians, which may have been the belief that the White House had, there was an early victory to be had. We've been training the Ukrainian, NATO's been training them for years and we've been supplying, we've been supplying America a lot of arms to them. And they were a much better fighting force than they were a decade earlier. Uh, maybe they thought it would be a, an easy win, but it wasn't. By late September, it was certainly looking like a long, drawn-out draw at best. And um, uh, Biden decided uh, uh, to blow up the pipelines because he, I think the, the most logical explanation I have, it's not mine, it was made given to me by people on the mission, uh, that doesn't mean they had any firsthand information. Nobody talked to the president about this. But the thought was that Sh Chancellor Schultz might have thought with winter coming in September, he's better off keeping um, keeping an option open. And the option being to walk away from a war, stop putting bad money into, you know, good money after bad, because we wanted much more investments from Germany in the war, much more money. America spent something like $140 billion on this war at a time when 15 million Americans were taken off Medicare, free, free health care by, by this administration. I mean, what's going on in America, and this is just outrageous, that he's fighting a war he's not going to win. And he's into it. I think he thinks this is re-election. You know, he, he feels the war is very popular. I think there's evidence showing us it's, 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 this popularity is dwindling, particularly as the, the cost of uh, subsidizing it goes on. And anyway, the bottom line is that uh, I think Biden, Biden decided to do it, or at least the reason, the only reason it makes sense is to, to take away an option for Schultz. Take away an option for Germany to decide they're not going to, they're, they're done putting bad, as I said, bad, good money after bad, and they're going to look away. And uh, uh, by blowing it up, uh, uh, he's he's put, well, uh, we'll see. There's a, a, the economy in Germany is uh, on the verge. It's, um, it's falling. It's not in dire straits, but the prediction is there's going to be a serious recession. And if it's a cold winter, last winter was quite mild. Uh, I remember pictures of ski resorts over Christmas having no snow in them in 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 the uh, in the Swiss Alps, and uh, this winter if the odds are odds are will be a lot colder. There's going to be a great demand for gas. He doesn't have, he doesn't have that pipeline, he doesn't have um, the ability to keep the uh, machinery running. The great industrial fortress Germany is, and also to keep the people warm. Uh, last year he subsidized about twenty to twenty five percent of the heating costs. Uh, with cash uh, in the German treasury. This year, he won't be able to do that. 
And so the option is to buy highly priced liquid liquefied natural gas from us. We were charging, of course, two to three times the normal price last year for it. Uh, they may be able to get some gas, liquefied natural gas out of uh, China. Uh, their economy is slowed down and China is a big user of gas. As we all know, they're buying it from Saudi Arabia right now and paying in uh, Chinese currency. It's a big blow to us in America. So um, we're looking at a fall that could be an economic disaster and a political disaster for Schultz. And he's being a good boy. He's keeping his mouth shut. He's not saying what he knows. I don't know if he knew in advance. I think he certainly has to know now what happened. Um, the idea that a Ukrainian group of dissident divers could do it, it took the best divers in America. And we've been, uh, we're, we're good at, you know, we're good at, we our divers are good at doing uh, doing good things, uh, clearing um, clearing harbors of old sunken ships from World War II, et cetera. And also, blowing up oil rigs we don't like in secrecy. I mean, you know, they, these guys are good, and they practice. The idea that a, a group of um, a Ukrainian divers could pull off something like this is just on the, anybody in the diving. Look, the truth is people in the diving community know what happened, but they're not talking. I mean, I happen to know that there are, you know, last year, building pipelines underwater, you, you've got a lot of gas and oil in, in Russia and other places, and getting it to the places that it's needed has always been a problem. Overland, you have to go through third countries. There's a Russian pipeline that still goes through Ukraine that's still viable even now. And the Russians are paying uh, the, the, the the portage fees, right? To this day, there's a pipeline that goes into Czechoslovakia, et cetera, um, uh, former Warsaw Pact countries. That pipeline was started in the uh, late 50s, early 60s, and it's been going on. Uh, but and, and there's been a lot of problems. Ukrainians tapping into it, uh, siphoning off oil, uh, gas, and oil. Anyway, it is a gas. It is a. It's an oil pipeline. Anyway, uh, so um, the industry. There's. I think last year there was twelve thousand miles of pipeline built underwater. And I will tell you, I've told this to reporters. Go talk to the people in the industry because they know who did it. I mean, I know they know, uh, but I I can't say how I know it. Uh, just like I, it's not that I don't want to tell you what I know about about the uh, dike, but it's just something um, uh, I'm I'm in the process of writing, and uh, there's a reason for. Everything. Oh, sure, I understand that uh, completely. Of course, yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I should have told uh, you. As you were talking said. about the, yeah, uh, as you were talking about the well shrunken nature uh, of government in your country and in mine. Uh, I got to thinking about Nixon and Kissinger, who committed, of course, many, many crimes. You could say that at 100 years old, Henry Kissinger is absolute proof that only the good die young. But Nixon and Kissinger had a foreign policy of some sophistication, not the least uh, of which was to do everything they could to keep China and Russia as far apart from each other as possible. Our leaders in this generation, uh, the Blinkens, uh, you won't believe it, but our foreign secretary's name is Cleverly, and if ever a man were inaptly named. Uh, but people like that in today's generation of policymakers, of, uh, of statesmen, if you like, uh, seem so much less than the people that we had before for all their sins and even crimes. Have you got a view on that? How did that happen if you agree that it did? Well, you're absolutely right. Right now, the, the, the paucity of intellect among, among the foreign ministers is just a frightening and embarrassing. Um, your, your, former, your former leader was, when she was foreign minister, was was i guess a comedy act at best uh so we have a, a, a um, there there's what, what what this sort of visceral uh, constant perverse hatred of of russia and nobody was more anti-communist in his career than nixon and kissinger also and yet they cut a deal with with the uh russia um uh, in 1972, they made a, a deal with missiles, and Russia repaid him by cutting back support from uh, Vietnam. It was a very cynical deal. I think Nixon has, my view of Kissinger always is going to be that um, uh, when he 
didn't get this. You know, I did the My Lai Massacre story, the story when we killed 500 people. And by the way, when you you you, you say, um, uh, are you worried about the criticism about my pipeline story? That story was when I wrote 500 people were killed um, in Vietnam and by American troops and raped and mutilated. That story was, oh, my God, it was it took a, a year and a half. It was completely covered up. Um, ditto. I wrote a story about, you know, the CIA spying on American citizens, what we're not supposed to do. Unlike your services, you have your five that can do what it wants. But in America, the in the our foreign intelligence cannot operate domestically. It took, I think, four months before that story got acknowledged. So this is all part of the game when you write stuff that's out of the league. But Kissinger always struck me. Um, I, 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 I've spent a lot of time looking at containment. You know, I'm old now and there was COVID. I had some project I was doing that it was hard to do. You couldn't travel. And I think the mistakes of containment after World War II were the gravest, really. I keep on thinking about how America got into uh, the war in Southeast Asia, so Vietnam, was a fear that if uh, South Vietnam fell to the communists, um, uh, uh, we'd be fighting um, North Vietnam and the Chinese. It would be, a, you know, that we intertwined all of that stuff. And I will tell you that we're coming up now in next in two years, this this time of year, it's going to be the, the 50th anniversary or beginning the war or when the war ended, when we the horrible scene in 1975 of, of Vietnamese clinging to the helicopters, the 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 the, um, the, the uh, whatever they, the landing gear, the, the landing pods of them trying to get off from the American embassy as we were driven off by the communists. And so what happened then? about when you think about containment what happened then is we lost vietnam in late april early may uh fell to the communists uh, from north vietnam and uh the, the not necessarily national liberation front many of them were not communists but anyway they they joined with the, the north and then two weeks later in cambodia um uh, the uh, the Khmer rouge overthrew that government and we lost cambodia two weeks after vietnam and then the other tripod that made up Southeast Asia for us, Laos fell with Khmer Rouge a couple of weeks later. So within a month and maybe a week and 10 days, we lost all of Southeast Asia to communist units. And the whole basis for going in was to fight uh, the spread of uh, communism and containment, the American policy of containment, with the Brits too. And so what happened? Uh, somebody very wise asked that rhetorical question to me and I sat there and listened. And he said, and nothing, nothing happened. In fact, we're the largest trading partners right now in America with the Vietnamese, and we do business with the other countries. And so the whole anti, no, the whole post-war notion that we had to stop Russia and communism, and I'm, I'm sure Stalin was as crazy as you want to make anybody and paranoid as most of our leaders are, and, but still, you just start thinking that maybe we did so many things wrong. Any in any case, I view Kissinger. I can't help it. I view him as somebody when he can't go to sleep. Um, uh, you know, I, the old cliche in America is uh, you count you know, little baby lambs. He's got to count count little Vietnamese and Cambodian infants who were burned and maimed and killed before he can get to sleep. So I don't have any sympathy for him. I actually think Nixon was more astute in terms of foreign policy than Kissinger. He was more flexible, more willing to make a deal with the with the, the rotten communists in China and Russia uh, to stop the war, which is what he did. He cut a deal with both. It's actually very shrewd stuff. Why do you think, Mr. Hirsch, that, and we both lived uh, through it, uh, why do you think there was so much more footage and reportage of the war in Vietnam with technology not a scintilla as powerful and ubiquitous as that which we have now, uh, compared to the footage and coverage of the war in Ukraine. Uh, I don't myself watch a lot of uh, mainstream television, but I'm sure I'd pick up if I was seeing the kind of uh, battlefield footage and carnage and so on from Ukraine as I did as a young man of Vietnam. That has to be deliberate, no? I don't know. I mean, I, I, that's a cosmic question. 
uh, for which I just don't have an answer. I will tell you there is available stuff. Um, some of the best stuff, alas, comes from uh, Russian sources who cover the war much more enthusiastically than the West does. Um, uh, we have a lot of reporters in the American newspapers have reporters, but they're they're tied basically to the uh, to the uh, to to the Zelensky regime. They they work out of uh, Kiev. They are taken to the front, but they're taken under controlled circumstances. There's no coverage of the other side because you know we don't go there. Uh, we don't go to the Russian side. Um, um, I have seen footage of what's going on now. Um, I guess mostly from Russian, but there's also some independence footage, and it's pretty ghastly what's going on now. It's it's a bloodbath for the Ukrainians, uh, only because, as I said, you you can't put 30 or 40, 50 brigades, all with different leadership, different manpower, different weaponry, and no no joint training. You can't put them into a war together. It's just it won't work. They they don't support each other. They 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 work. They can't work together, and. Um, they can't work efficiently together. They can try. And so we're seeing uh, units just being separated, isolated. I, I've seen some horrible stuff of some of the tanks behaving, the, the Ukrainian tanks tanks behaving r r stupidly, really, if you will, following one into a, a into a, a slog, uh, one in a row into slogs where they're all going to get destroyed. There's a lot of footage like that available, but it comes from sources that aren't trusted here in the West. And so... Um, uh, this morning's uh, newspaper, the, the, I haven't looked at the New York Times yet, but this morning's uh, newspaper, the Washington Post, which is as good as a paper as we get these days. Although I'm, 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 I'm. Uh, uh, what happened to the Western Press? The good. Press, I worked at the New York Times for seven years during the. I was at the New Yorker, and I was hired away. And believe me, the New Yorker is a much more pleasant place to work than the New York Times. But. I, uh, I thought I could do more at the Times, the publishers every day. And I went to work there for seven, eight years in, in, in Vietnam. I started doing the Vietnam War. I ended up involved with the Nixon stuff and uh, uh, the uh, Nixon stuff and Watergate. And then um, and doing a lot of stuff about intelligence corruption and stuff like that. But when I went to the Times, um, uh, it was a straight paper. I joined the New York Times because I was against the war. And they knew I was against the war. I thought it was awful. And I was writing a lot about it. I already done the Milai stuff. And I had people inside who thought it was awful who were talking to me. And the Times would take my stories and they would have their usual thing from Washington talking about how things are going well and have a piece for me right next to it saying no. And, but we're not getting the no right now. We're not getting the, the and I will tell you, there's a big no going on right now. Um, what's going on now is is the today's paper dealt with something about Putin being in trouble domestically. <laughs> um, you know the oligarchs, many of them, uh, who fled Russia with their yachts and their private planes are 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 being sanctioned and it's being effective. And many of them are are crawling back into Russia with their money. Uh, they can't, you know, they can't get to their boats and planes. Uh, they're they're bar embargoed or locked up right now as as part of the sanction process. But they can certainly they have passports. They can certainly move. They're coming back to Russia with their money, and so yes, things are not as good as they used to be in Russia. Uh, but the idea that they're desperate is just wrong. They've been selling their oil at a at a discount price to places like India. They and the world has uh, the percentage of the of particularly of of the african and central uh, uh, asian and uh, south asian countries that have changed from being pro america to being pro russia is really quite dramatic that is more than much more than half the world's population supports russia in the war and not not the united states this was never the way it was we've lost so much credibility in in around the world and so um as the war goes on um, we've just had Saudi Arabia cut a deal with Iran. We hate Iran. That's a big blow to us. And what does Iran do? Because Saudi Arabia uh, is beginning to talk to them. We're talking about Sunni Shia. This is a huge change. The Sunni Shia connection was not there. It's happened, I think, because of Ukraine and dislike of the war. Uh, uh, Saudi Arabia, by the way, is selling 25% of its oil to, to China, as I mentioned. But the, the Saudis immediately uh, the, cut a deal, and the Iranians immediately responded by, um, uh, they have a lot of control in Yemen over the Houthi tribes, 
And the Saudis uh, have forced the, the Houthis to cut back, and we're going to have a settlement in Yemen that we in America could never get. So we're, we're getting pushed out. Uh, we still have, get this, 800 bases outside of America, 180 of them special forces. And that's just an astonishing number. When you think how few your country has, how few Russia does, how few China does, we're talking about in China and Russia, single in digits, just very few things outside. 800 bases, quarter million people, we military people in South Korea. And so we're, we're, we're lost in some sort of um, uh, uh, inability. Well, of course, we have a very conservative politics, you know, we, we but he's even losing, um, excuse me, he's even losing uh, support um, uh, for the war. The economic cost is get, getting to people. The polls show that more and more people are worried about the economic costs. Way uh, like 62% are now worried about the war. And, uh, I think Biden's stuck into a mold where he thinks the war is the ticket to be reelected. And... Um, uh, it, it seems to me we're in for some real political problems here in America. Lastly, Mr. Hirsch, and I'm grateful for your time. Uh, we both cried, I'm sure, uh, when Robert Kennedy was uh, cruelly murdered in California Jack, Jack on Kennedy. his way Jack to Kennedy. the presidency. Oh, we were talking about Jack, no, Jack uh, Kennedy. No, Robert uh, well, I, I, of course, both oh, were mean, cruelly murdered, but Kennedy. I'm sure we both, we both, yeah, we both, we both cried at the murder of Bobby Kennedy. What do you think of his son's run for the presidency? It seems to be exciting, rather a lot of people. Well, I've talked to him a lot because he he was um, initially would call me just because I'm a journalist. Uh, um, uh, about uh, anti-vaccine stuff. Um, I've always thought he was loony. I, I don't think it's going to go anywhere. I, I initially thought you were talking about Jack Kennedy, which is still, um, there's a lot more to know about that too. I, I don't mean necessarily about the assassination, but about the politics of those days. Um, uh, no, I don't, I, I'm, not, I'm not a fan of Robert Kennedy. Um, um, uh, he started off anti-vaccine. He's getting popularity and people are talking about him but I'm not a fan. Um, I, I just, um, 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 I'm just not a fan. I mean, I, um, I, I don't, okay. I haven't talked to him. Cool. Before, but, but he used to just go on and on about vaccinations um, and that, that scared the hell out of me. You know, I, I have a wife that's a doc and my daughter that's a doc. And uh, uh, I, I do think vaccinations are important. <laughs> and, and, um, and he didn't. And so that's that. But I look, America looks up like, the uh, yeah. Yeah, it's up for grabs. But the leader of the opposition looks like he's on his way to prison. Uh, it used to be a hallmark of a banana republic uh, that the people in power put their principal opposition figures in jail. Is that what's happening now with the Mar-a-Lago uh, charges? Uh, I haven't talked to anybody. Um, uh I probably could because I know some of the people, but um, I I have this weird feeling about Trump that he's not going to be that easily knocked off. You know, I I uh, I know he did pay off some uh, some woman to stop talking about him, their sexual relationship, um, but um, and I know he just settled a case against some woman. He lost a five million dollar case, some woman that he molested. <laughs> And I, I, I look, um, uh, uh, anybody who did what he did to the Constitution is not, I'm never going to support, but I, I'm not sure. Um, uh, uh, he, he, look, the truth is that, in my experience as a journalist, people take a lot of documents home, period. I mean, I, I'm not sure. I think the case. Uh, I'm, I'm not justifying anything he did. I've just read the papers on it. I don't know anything more. It could be some of the documents were seriously important. And he's an impulsive, childlike character. And um, you, you cannot forgive a man for uh, over, trying to overthrow the government, he, as he definitely was. So that's he doesn't deserve to be anywhere. But um, I think the case that's going to be the most important one is the one in Georgia where he called up the uh, 
the head of the campaign and said, give me 12,000. He wanted one vote more to win the race. And he did it on a recording, a tape recording, and he also made those calls elsewhere. That seems to me. Um, uh, <laughs> but, but, you know, uh, I, I, I don't see anybody, I don't see any savior for America coming. We don't have a... Uh, we don't have a uh, we don't have a Lincoln, Abe Lincoln, in 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 uh, somebody coming or an FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. We don't have anybody coming to save us right now politically. There's nobody there that's going to change the world. Um, um, uh, Jack Kennedy was a lot more flawed than 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 we know, but um, uh, but we I just don't see it. I, I thought I actually did have high hopes for for. Um, uh, Obama, but uh, uh, everything he said he was going to do, he was going to close the the horrible prison we have at Guantanamo, that torture chamber, that costs us more respect around the world than anything else we've done. Uh, a prison in which people go to and never come out. No habeas corpus. No, no, uh, under the Constitution, anybody who's in a jail has certain rights. All that was washed away. He said he was going to do something interesting and novel about Central America. I mean, about about a uh, about the Middle East gave a speech, a very famous speech in Cairo at the uh, university there. Didn't do that. Uh, he didn't stop the war in Afghanistan. Actually, Biden did to his credit. Uh, and um, and then he had that terrible disaster where the bomb went off. Uh, but he, he did stop the war. He didn't do it the right way. He pulled out too many troops first, et cetera, et cetera. But at least he said, no, that's the only thing I really respect him for as president. You got some legislation through, but the real problem we have is uh, th there's nobody there. There's nobody in the nobody coming up. Nobody that we can all uh, all parties can revolve around. So we're going to have this incredible um, 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 uh, east west, if you will, north south uh, pro you know Democrat Republican. It's a it's a total. There's there's no there's no middle ground anywhere between uh, what we call the left and the right. Neither one are quite right uh, words. So America's in for a very tough time. Um, uh, the next election, wh whoever is running, I don't think it'll be Biden. I don't think he'll be there. But I don't know who's coming up that's going to be able to win over some of the Republican zealots. And so um, uh, this is certainly a very, very bad time. Look, you guys are going through a very bad time, too. You've had some awful leadership. I was just about to say, uh, uh, the, Oscar Wilde said we were uh, two peoples divided by a common language, but we are increasingly united by the paucity of our national leadership. And the two of them in double harness is a very significant reason why the world is as it is today. Seymour Hersh, you're a superstar. I'll just say one more Everyone say needs one more to thing. follow you. Let me say one more thing. Let me yeah, say go one ahead. Thing. Go ahead. I always looked at the parliamentary process as being a savior for us. I'm talking about decades ago. I thought we got to get rid of this this democratic this two party system. But you've demonstrated to me that's forget it. That's not you know it's not going to work. So we have to find some other way of running countries. Uh, if we could get rid of leadership, that might be great. Just get people who aren't leaders.